welcome everyone to this session of the Foresight Existential Hope Group. Uh, I, my name is Lou, I'm the coordinator of this group uh, whose premise is that we live at a very high stake, special time in the history of the Great Human Project, one where things could change uh, drastically. Ex uh, technology is developing exponentially fast, faster than perhaps our brains, our uh, societies, our institutions can absorb safely. And this is creating of problems, uh, the gravest of them all being the threat to the very existence of humanity and our civilization. And to quote, uh, the Consilience Project website, which we are going to discuss today. What we need is fundamentally new problem solving and coordinated choice making capacities that are adequate to address the complexity, the scale, the rate of change, and the significance of the novel issues we face. With the Existential Hope Group here, we have given ourselves uh, the ambitious task to create the most beautiful futures we dare to imagine. Futures of radical abundance, uh, of flourishing for all, for life, for the biosphere. Uh, we want to expand the boundaries of human knowledge to unfathomable lengths and uh, to accelerate the technologies that can manifest those futures. But uh, we acknowledge the need to remain careful, deeply conscious, and uh, level-headed in this quest. This is no place for blind optimism, um, or we will fall into the, the precipice. So we walk a delicate line. We sure do. I'm cognizant uh, of the gazing abyss our dreams should still be bold and daring um, and X, hopefully. Uh, this is how we build uh, an era of exponential technology that is constructive rather than destructive. Uh, and this is how we build a new civilization, uh, one that is safe, uh, that is a safe steward of its incredible power. There is no guarantee we'll make it, uh, but if we don't try, we won't succeed. <laughs> so I am uh, totally thrilled to welcome a great duo today to discuss uh, strategies to build collective intelligence that match our ambitions and challenges. Uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger, who is a founder of the Consilience Project, and Phoebe Tickle, who is uh, a Foresight Fellow and advisor to the Continuance Project as well. Uh, most of you probably know Daniel, whose work focuses on long-term civilization design um, and tries to develop better collective capacities for sense-making, meaning-making, and uh, more informed choice-making. Um, so Daniel, I mean, I told you, but uh, you've been a great inspiration uh, for my work, and I'm very grateful that you're joining the session today. Uh, Phoebe, uh, as I said, is a Foresight Fellow, uh, also a dear co-conspirator for good um, to both you and I, actually. Um, and with Moral Imagination has uh, this project that works on empowering uh, collective imagining and communities. Um, and so is extremely aligned uh, with existential hope and the perfect bridge between existential hope and the Continuance Project. So um, yeah, in summary, I am really grateful for this opportunity to bolster both of your missions. Um, and maybe before we start uh, and get um, into the, the, the meat of this discussion, uh, I just wanted to say that one of the central tenets of the existential hope approach is that when we look at how our society and culture thinks about the future, uh, there are way too many dystopian visions out there and almost no positive envisioning. Uh, and, but to quote Lucille Clifton, 
Uh, we can't create what we can't imagine. And so before we dive into uh, problem solving, concrete strategies, uh, and the continent project, I would love to hear uh, from both of you briefly, what is your most ambitious, uh, deep and exciting vision for the long-term future? Uh, let's say, if we solved existential risk and achieved existential security, uh, what would happen? You know, what, what, what could it look like? What are the possibilities? Uh, another way to frame this question, at least uh, for me, that's the way I understand it, is almost what drives you to so much reflection, work, efforts to build the civilization in your words, Danielle, that is not self-terminating? <laughs> why, why so much work? Uh, and beyond, what are the futures that inspire you? Uh, where do you draw your motivation from? So yes, maybe any of you feeling uh, ready and excited to share first? Phoebe, do you wanna go first? I think you should go first, Daniel. Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, first, thank you for uh, inviting me here today. I, I kind of can't believe that I haven't been to this group before understanding what the mission is and how it's framed. The framing is beautiful. Like it, there's a lot of things that I often talk about that sounds like I don't have to talk about here because they're already givens. Um, but the way you framed the unique power that exponential tech gives and how do we become safe stewards for it, I think is a, uh, a really great framing. And when you said there's a lot of dystopic features, but not that many positive ones, there's, there's positive ones are just silly. Um, they like the, they fail quite obviously, um, or they depend upon magic, dilithium crystals and warp drives or whatever. So it's how do we have ones that's, that don't depend upon things that we can't depend upon, that don't hit obvious failure modes and where there's an, an enactment path from here to there because oftentimes the enactment issue requires more um, violence than makes that in state actually possible to change where entrenched patterns are. I think it's a great thing for the group to be focused on. A lot of people think, okay, let's say that we were to ensure a post X risk world of existential security. Now the whole focus is we get to uh, become a higher Kardashev scale civilization and go spread out through the galaxy, or we get to do advanced transhumanism and solve life extension and fuse our consciousness with the cloud and the AI, or and none of those inspire me, actually. Uh, those are fine. Maybe we do some of those. Um, I, but it, I'm actually not inspired by a getting somewhere in particular. Um, like this might, I, I don't know, this might be a strange way to start it off, but you asked what I'm motivated by. I am motivated by the beauty of life that already is just continuing to get to flourish. I'm motivated by moms getting to keep falling in love with their babies and kids getting to discover nature and trees and fall in love for the first time and study the beauty of poetry and mathematics. Like it is prima facie meaningful. It doesn't need to go anywhere in particular. It does also have an evolutionary process. There's a becoming, but it's not a becoming towards some omega point. It's just the process of becoming. And the meaningfulness of that is grounded in the being of it. Um, that's the thing that I'm ultimately care about and I'm in service to. And it's not a given at this given particular time that that does get to continue here. And, can, and it's also not a given that it gets to continue as well. Obviously it's not, uh, equally beautiful to be born into all situations. And so to the degree that we have been born into situations that give us some capacity to possibly be able to affect this, the future that other people uh, will be born into, uh, that's meaningful. Awesome, yeah. Uh, there's already extraordinary amounts of beauty all the, uh, everywhere around us. I, I totally uh, resonate with that. Um, okay, TV, want to share? Yes, um, very happy to share. What, I'd love, what an amazing way to kick off a conversation with Daniel, who, um, yeah, I love thinking with and being in conversation with and with this amazing community that I'm 
having the chance to discover more and more through the um, yeah honor of being a fellow. So yeah, very, very pleased to be here. Um, Lou, when you asked me this question, you, you know, you, you kind of primed me a little bit with it. And I, I sat thinking about it for like a, a good 20 minutes, just, just thinking about when you asked me like, what is the future that really motivates you? And I realized that um, there's something inherently creepy about projecting a future that I think is good onto the lives of um, people I've never met yet and who are not yet born. Like I really sat with that and I was like, that's just such a meta way to answer this question, but that's honestly what came up. And actually I, I came to something quite similar to what Daniel said, which is this kind of a future, a future that looks good to me because I can only really project a desirable future um, that feels good to me. I don't want to project that on others, but it's, it is a society and civilization that is based on wisdom and based around wisdom. And for me, wisdom um, really comes down to two things. The first is sacredness. Um, and when I say sacredness, I don't mean like worship or something religious or even spiritual doesn't really feel like the right word. For me, sacredness is, is being in touch with the cosmic reality that is being like a conscious being alive in this moment on earth and just like the crazy amounts of like statistical chance that this is happening and that right now all of our neurons are firing in a way that we're able to communicate we're not even in the same physical reality like it's just like every moment there's just like so much incredible meaning and richness and I feel as if um, the way we've organized our society today actually actively wrenches us away from that all the time and this is actually why um, Consilience is such an exciting project for me and why I'm, I'm involved as an advisor and love, love the work is like being dragged away from that realization and, and lived experience of the sacredness of all life is partly, a, you know, to do with the sovereignty of like the epistemic sovereignty of being able to, um, yeah, be a sovereign individual who can be free in the moment to feel and think what they wish to and not be bombarded and manipulated by advertising or algorithms that are kind of pulling your attention or even just like artificially constructed scarcity that that create these um states of being that pull us out of that um sacredness so i'd say something something like sacredness and sovereignty um but i really have no idea what that future looks like whether it's on the earth or on moon or underground i mean who knows like the the actual physical what is very unclear to me and i'm and i'm not i'm quite suspicious of anybody who has like an ideology of what the future should look like so hope that wasn't too meta an answer no no totally uh, resonate with that too and um yeah, I don't think anyone knows what it will look like, but uh, for sure, I think the trajectory to get there is not going to be boring. Um, um, anyway, so thank you. There was like a really, I really appreciate the priming the session with this, and also resonate with uh, both of what you said uh, greatly. So now that we know what we are fighting for. Uh, let's dive into the pragmatic and the concrete solutions. Um, Daniel, <laughs> what are the concrete solutions that are proposed by the Continuance Project and how? what are the goals and how do we reach them? Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a step or two in between um, concrete goals and how we reach them and what is most uh, spiritually motivating where we started. Let me see if I can try to do that first. So you talk about existential hope as a kind of uh, uh, reframe of existential risk. What would a future that is post existential risk and, and what would a transition process be that would get there so I'll just speak about existential risk for a moment because uh, if we're going to make a civilization that makes it, we have to make sure that it doesn't fail from any of the fail cases. 
and it takes only any of them. There's this asymmetry where any of the existential risks happening and the civilization doesn't move forward to not happen. They to, to move forward, they have to all not happen. So we have to understand not just the whole extras landscape, but what about the patterns of human behavior at scale, the patterns of markets and the nature of how we create technology and the nature of how we do governance and decision making orient towards catastrophic and existential risk and don't orient towards solving it that well. So that those are the things that we're looking at solving to find kind of categorical solutions. And the, the first thing I'll say, and I'm sure this is obvious here, is people have faced, civilizations have faced existential risk for a long time, historically, but they were only local, right? They faced it in war and they faced it in famine and sometimes in natural disaster. And in fact, every previous civilization doesn't still exist. They all failed from either internal civilizational decay issues or uh, you know, outstripping their environment or being overthrown or something like that. It's just, we never had the level of technology that allowed a global existential risk to be a real thing until the bomb. And for most of us, the bomb was before we were born. So it seems like a long time ago, but in terms of the arc of history, and obviously in terms of evolutionary time, it was like a second ago. And so we have to get that when we think about the actual possibility of global existential risk or even radical regress of civilization. Maybe there's some humans, but we kind of lose civilizational progress. It's a super new phenomena. And to really get the sense of like the couple things that we have to factor right now. Um, up until the bomb, adjacent powers and particularly adjacent major powers always fought wars. There were never really long periods where they didn't fight wars. And so when you study the history of Europe or you're studying history in general, it's a history of largely inter-kingdom, inter-nation, inter-tribal, depending upon where you go, warfare. And with the bomb, we had this we had the situation where we could never fight wars again between major powers. We could fight proxy wars, we could fight asymmetric wars. And so that was a really radically new situation that the world couldn't use the only problem solving mechanism for border disputes that it had always had as a last resort uh, against other things. And the Bretton Woods world was the answer, which is nation states alone don't prevent world war. We've seen that twice. We can't have world war again. We need some international structures, the UN, the World Bank, the, you know, um, the whole Bretton Woods agreement process that can make it to where we're so economically interdependent on each other through globalization and global supply chains that it's never more profitable to war than to not war, where it would damage us to go to large scale war and where we can grow GDP so much that everybody can get more without having to take it from others. This is the you know very highly positive sum game theoretic dynamics uh, decreasing violence. You fast forward 75 years and you run running that kind of globalized supply chain and seeing what that did to population and resource consumption per capita and cumulative environmental effects, you start hitting all the planetary boundaries and you can't run that thing anymore. And you get to the place where almost all of the commodities that we depend upon are built over six continents of these kind of vast supply chains where something like COVID happens in one area and you get cascading failures across agriculture and shipping and tech and finance across the whole world. So you get fragility. That highly interconnected system also means that failures in one place can cascade. And so for a number of reasons, we're kind of at the end of the Bretton Woods answer. And now we need an answer that still doesn't have war because now we don't just have the bomb. We have many existential weapons, you know, many different catastrophic weapons. No, and there aren't just two actors that have them. There's lots of actors, including non-state actors that have them. So we still need a no war solution, but it can't involve radical growth of material, linear materials economy through GDP and increasing fragility of supply chains. And so now we need a new thing and there's no precedent for it. And because we have a fully globalized civilization, we need a civilization that doesn't fail and there's no precedent for that. And so how do we make a civilization that doesn't fail and how do we make a civilization that doesn't need war and whose answer for not war doesn't cause those other risks those are like new questions that we have to answer that previous civilizations figured some parts out but definitely didn't figure these things out um 
And when you say safe stewards, like that's a really key way of thinking of all of the X risks that we face are mediated by tech. If we had stone tools only, none of them would exist. Um, if we were in the Bronze Age, none of them would exist. And so the question is, if tech is extending our choice making power, how do what types of choices do we have to make for the choice making power to actually be viable and, and thriving long term? And I don't know if people here have had these conversations or heard where I've talked about it, but uh, we have a world where we still model ourselves in a kind of we as apex predators and in a, it, using social Darwinism and game theory. And, uh, but we're not apex predators because of tech. That's kind of the key insight is an orca can eat one tuna at a time and we can put out a drift net and take up a whole school full of tuna. That's not an apex predator. We can move to every environment and become the apex predator in every environment they can't. So we actually have but we're in a multipolar trap of if we don't behave like the apex predator, somebody else does, meaning they will do the tragedy of the commons or the arms race thing, get so much game theoretic advantage in near term that we then uh, fail in the long term. So everyone is racing in kind of multipolar traps, applying apex predator theory, but with something more like the power of gods in terms of being able to destroy species, create new species, destroy ecosystems, make an Anthropocene. So. You know, the mythopoetic is with the power of God, you have to have the love and wisdom of gods to guide it. And this is Phoebe's, you know, wisdom and sacredness. The love is the recognition of the sacredness or the intrinsic meaningfulness of life. And wisdom is the how do I think through what and feel through what right choice and in, in acknowledgement of that sacredness looks like. And obviously, the market system doesn't do that adequately, and none of our kind of global systems do. And it, that makes sense. Um, so what the Consilience Project is aiming to do is to describe the current problem landscape in a clear enough way that the design solutions for what are, what are the adequate problem solving processes we need to implement to be able to address all of the existential and catastrophic risks and sustainable development type goals, the things that require global coordination that we're mostly completely failing at. Like, why are we orienting in a way that causes those problems in the first place and that is almost completely ineffective at solving them? And ineffective at solving them looks like either we don't solve it at all or we solve one problem by and displace harm externality to some other problem in the process. And because somebody's probably going to recognize we're going to externalize harm in the process, they're probably going to fight it. And so then we have groups fighting to stop each other from doing whatever it is that they're trying to do because they're optimizing some beneficial metric at the expense of something else. And so what we're aiming to do with consilience is to say, okay, the founding fathers didn't have the problem landscape we have. So it's not in the constitution. Marx didn't. Uh, the Scottish Enlightenment thinking of market theory didn't, even the Bretton Woods folks didn't. So how do we understand this problem landscape well enough to say, what do the new kinds of problem solving and coordination processes have to do? What do the new institutions have to do? And for those institutions to not come about by imposition, which is its own fail case, they have to arise from people who understand it, want it, and are capable of participating with it, which is what is the future of open society in the kind of exponential tech digital age? And so then what is a culture in terms of what people would have to value that they would invest in their sense making, meaning making, choice making capacities in this way. So framing that up kind of theoretically and framing up situational assessments of what's going on in the world currently in light of that social theory uh, is a major part of what we're doing. And so people might have heard of consilience in terms of a media point of view. And it's because if you want to run a democracy or an open society, if you're enough governance, it's up form by the people that you have to have education, high quality education and high quality fourth estate or news and kind of media as prerequisite institutions, because the people have to be able to make sense of the world and they have to have good information. And the complexity of the types of problems we need to deal with has gone up radically and the quality of education, in the fourth estate have both eroded. And so we're going to be addressing some issues in that are driving culture wars and in terms of the perverse incentive and um, technological effects and whatever in the media space. We're not going to try to fix that. We couldn't. That has to be a decentralized effort. We're going to try to spec out what should a fourth estate 
do? What does it have to do? What could it look like in a post-digital world as opposed to the broadcast world? Um, what are the ways in which it has eroded? And what are some examples or prototypes of what the future of that could look like as a hope to be able to play a role in catalyzing a decentralized movement of activity towards a, a, a renaissance or a new kind of cultural enlightenment of people thinking much more deeply about how do we adequately restructure our institutions and upline from that, how do we develop our humans in a way that can give rise to that. I think that's a fair intro. Okay, awesome. Um, and uh, to get into kind of the um, yeah, the, 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 what we need to do in order to do that, you know, like the steps and like uh, the modalities really concretely into the, the project, I think uh, it would be super valuable for this community. And also perhaps, I mean, I hope uh, for the continuous project uh, to be, uh, for those two communities to be mutually exposed. I think there is a lot of uh, possible synergies between them. Uh, so yeah, like if you feel like um, given the broad lines, uh, I would be super excited uh, for us all to hear them. Yeah. Phoebe, any thoughts before we take the next step? Um, I have a lot of thoughts. I mean, I have, I'd, I'd love to hear you talk a bit about, you know, when you say cultural renaissance, you know, what, what do you mean by that? What does culture mean? And you said it's about people thinking more deeply and um, one of the first things that comes to my mind is, um, how, you know, which which people and how and and do you think that everybody uh, in the world is is capable and wanting to do that culture or that you know thinking that you envision as part of where where you'd like the world to be? Yeah, you were. Um bringing up the question when we spoke yesterday about the uh, different thinkers on democracy and if democracy is a viable kind of idea at all or if a uh, ruling of an elite is actually a, a necessary thing purely by cognitive capacity and typology or something like that. Uh, shall we address that? Um, sure, go ahead. And then I think getting into the detail of how the project works makes sense, maybe. Yeah, next. We don't have to actually try to answer the hard question of all of the details of how much of typology is intrinsic and how much of certain capacities are genetic or in, in some other method intrinsic. Um, what types of Gaussian distributions are gonna be based on biology independent of conditioning? Is everybody in the future all going to be thinkers or are there gonna be people who are doing abstract thinking and other people that are doing art? And like, we, the, we could have that conversation, but if, in, if we just wanna start by saying, I think the way the conversation is usually framed has some bad assumptions that we can dispel pretty easily. Are there populations where the entire population over a period of generations has been radically more educated than other populations? Yes. So we can just do positive deviant analysis. Look at Jewish culture. Do Jewish, does Jewish culture ensure that there's a much higher level of education for all of the people in the culture than say the average United States does? Of course it does. And uh, obviously we can look at Singapore, Taiwan, Nordic countries, and be able to do the same thing on a country by country comparison. Um, and where it becomes really ridiculous to think of it as a genetic conversation at that point, because it's across the distribution of the whole population. You can also say, are there some populations that train all of their people and virtues differently? We can also see this change on a generational basis within the same culture. So can we get a Buddhist culture where we have roughly 10 million people fluxing populations over three millennia, mostly all who don't hurt bugs? Yes. Can we get a child soldier, you know, John Jaweed culture in Darfur where to make it to adulthood, you probably have to be a murderer. Yes, like human genetics selected for mimetics. We selected for the ability to 
do abstraction, which made language and tool making and the capacity to be very radically different with not that much consistent baseline so that we could learn how to text as opposed to throw spears or Mandarin as opposed to English or this environment as opposed to that one or because we're environment modifiers because of our tools, we have to come not fixed with a genetic code of a certain environment. We have to be able to take in the information of this new environment. So the flexibility of what we can do is huge. And we've done most of our social science after ubiquitous capitalism and industrialization and then took it as if that was just a given that, oh, human nature is this way. And it's just gibberish, right? It's ubiquitous conditioning. And then treating that as if it's human nature because it's ubiquitous. Um, so when you look at the Buddhists or the Jains or some cultures like that, you say, can humans, can we deal with the innate violent issues of us being primates and conflict theory stuff better? Yes. When we look at um, Jews and certain kinds of lines of a wealth elite and whatever we say within whole populations can we deal can we do much better say cognitive education cultural education the answer is of course yes can we do those together what what is a meaningful human life what are the capacities that we want to develop in humans what would that look like and then even just go to exeter academy or some highly elite private school where the kids of the elite go do they get a radically better education than most kids do and do you get a do you get a displacement of the whole gaussian distribution sure of course there's some super smart some kids who do really well at public school and some people who do bad at exeter but overall one bell curve is displaced two standard deviations from the other bell curve and so you're like okay well that that's a class issue right that's not a genetics issue that's not an aptitude or a typology issue that is a access to the kinds of resources issue. And that's not even addressing all the other aspects of culture that are developing people. It's just school. And it's not even a good idea of how to do schooling well. Um, one of the, so can we develop everybody radically more? Yes, there's just never been an interest in that. Like class interests have never wanted that because class interests benefit from a power law distribution and a power law distribution of power depends upon a power law distribution of access to information and information processing. So asymmetric information equals asymmetric game theoretic power, a uh, increase of the symmetry of information, information processing, choice-making capacity is fundamentally not aligned with a power law distribution. It is the solution to a power law distribution, but that also means it is antithetical to the most powerful interests in it. Um, so that's an important thing to understand in terms of enactment issues. Uh, one of the very big questions is in we we also didn't give a we never tried to educate very well the whole population because most of them were going to be laborers and you're like how much do you need to know about history and civics and game theory and coordination theory to pave roads all day or to lay bricks all day or to so why are we doing that additional costly educational investment if they're, it's not gonna be useful to you, there's no ROI to society. Well, the, the answer and the reason that George Washington said, uh, and I'll paraphrase, that the, the most important goal of the federal government is the comprehensive education of every single citizen in the science of government. Science of government was term of art then, meaning applying all of the kind of principles of being able to make sense, scientific like principles to what gives rise to government. So that was, do they know history? Do they know military theory? Do they know the classics? Do they know rhetoric? Do they? And it's fucking fascinating to get that he that the, uh, he said the number one aim of the federal government in founding this country, U.S., is the comprehensive education of every single citizen. He didn't say it was maintaining rule of law because if the goal is maintain rule of law, it won't be a, it won't stay a democracy. You will start emphasizing authoritarian power and you'll debase the democracy. If if the goal is protecting the borders or monetary supply or anything else, that'll happen. And so the only thing that could keep it a democracy is the comprehensive education of all the people. So the idea was even if they're laborers, they're also citizens, right? They also have a role, they have a civic duty. And so there's the development of civic knowledge and capacity and civic virtue necessary to play their role in the governance. They're not only members of the market, right? And that was the idea in a liberal democracy is that the citizens are engaging in the market for the innovation thing market does. And that's one of the roles of education. They're also engaging in the government. That's another one of the roles. And you can see that today, almost nobody, and you know, I know you're in London and there's a, a 
different but related story to ideals of the British Empire um, and, and England today, but nobody in the US thinks that they really like have a civic duty, that they engage in government, they bitch about government out there, but they consent to being governed by not being actively involved. They don't even want to go to jury duty. They don't, they don't want to pay attention to what the government is even actually doing governance about, right? So there, there's an education that would be required to even be able to do that. And you, you can notice that even the value, the idea that civic virtue is a thing kind of died with the boomers as the last generation that thought that was even a thing. Um, but let's come back to the market issue is oh, still how much can we invest in the comprehensive education if we're looking at Exeter Academy relative to most people being laborers because the people coming out of Exeter Academy and most Jews aren't going to become laborers, right? Um, well, this is where the future of technological automation and AI automation of rote tasks actually as everybody in here I'm sure talks about that either totally sucks and becomes the most powerful tool of wealth concentration that's ever been because now the, the people aren't even relevant as serfs, right? They aren't even relevant as laborers and that tech, and the wealth of the technology is owned by the few technology holders in the power law distribution. Or it becomes the basis of ending one of the fundamental tenets of the why market theory was the thing we had to work with, which is the jobs that make a society work need people to do them, but nobody wants to spend that much of their life doing certain jobs. So either the state has to force them or how do we make it to where the people also need the job so it self organizes, which means that the market forces them. Um, the ability to make it to where the jobs don't need the people anymore through so technological automation debases the need to have the people have to need the jobs, which is where UBI is the first concept, but it's not a very good concept. You can go beyond UBI to like access to commonwealth resources, generative shared access to commonwealth resources. That starts to become possible and the underlying coordination or motivational game theory starts to change. So one of the big questions in education is in a future that is post-information singularity, so you can't actually know all the information on a topic, and that is post, I won't say AGI, because that's actually a very different issue, but at least very good narrow AI applied to everything and robotics, and so automation. What is the role of humans in that world? Is there something that humans are still uniquely uh, good at and something that is connected to what is uniquely meaningful? And then what is the role of the educational system in developing those capacities in people? And then what is the kind of synthetic intelligence that is individual human intelligence doing what is uniquely good at humans, not us being shitty computers, because right now we largely train us to do shit that AIs are better at. So what is unique to human capacity? What are methods of collective intelligence so we can have sense-making, meaning-making, choice-making that is synergistic to the number of people that are engaging as opposed to uh, always leads to tribalism and conflict? Uh, and then aug augmented by computer intelligence. So the system as a whole is a synthesis, a synthetic intelligence of human and machine for the various things they do and human with each other. Uh, so we would say the governance system of the future has to have those criteria. The educational system would be preparing people for that. And uh, will everyone be doing abstract thinking about how to continue to evolve the system equally? Of course not. Just like everyone won't be doing poetry equally or whatever. But is there some element of civic responsibility where the rights and responsibilities have to be paired? That if people get rights without responsibilities, you get entitled shitty people. If people have responsibilities without rights, you have slaves. There has to be a pairing and a growth capacity and rights and responsibilities. Is there a kind of civic responsibility? And so thus a civic virtue that that responsibility arises from within them, as opposed to just being imposed on them, that still has to be there and certain capacities that have to be there for everybody to participate in governance, yes. And then to what degree is it customized? Does everybody have to understand microgrids well enough to vote on DOE policy? No. 
Some people will. So how do, how do we do that? That's a conversation we can get into in detail. But I do think most of the assumptions about what we can't achieve in education and that are, are based on things that are either just narrative warfare, not true, there's class warfare and whatever, or they're things that are about to go obsolete. Well, awesome. Uh, super interesting. Thank you um, for this also, again, like primer. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess before, um, yeah, I think that that was also like an interesting vision for the future. <laughs> uh, and hopefully, you know, we can, we can um, try to strive for these goals. Um, I guess now I kind of want to ask, like, how, how do we get there? And, you know, what is the, the strategy of the Continuance Project? Um, just yeah. because, I mean, that's one of the, the, the ideas with this group is often to try to elevate uh, the projects and the humans who drive them, who are like uh, trying to fix things at the moment. But um, yeah, I really appreciate it, actually, like uh, and see the value of um, everything you you just described. And um, yeah, I mean, what we're trying to you can tell that I like discussing the the fundamental theory, and that's the Consilience Project is actually doing that better, more formally across lots of things. We were just discussing the role of education, why education has been hard, some what positive deviants in education are, what the future, what the future role of education could be, et cetera. All of those topics deserve being addressed better because a lot of the ways that we think about problem solving have assumptions that either were never true or, or were true, but are no longer true. And, um, so uh, what, what I'm kind of doing where we're speaking through that so that hopefully we can think better together about uh, how to design a better future, the, the core of the Consilience Project is actually doing that function much better. So basically you, we have, uh, I'll, I'll kind of break it down. We have two major arms. There's a publishing effort and there's a movement building effort. And it's just starting. If you go to consilienceproject.org, you'll see the very beta version of the site we put up a week ago, a few days ago. And start with the About Us page. Like it's it's really beta. If I um, if I if I had my druthers, we would work on it for six more months before it was up at all. Um, there's about a half a dozen or so initial articles on there and half a dozen more will be up here shortly. Um, but I'll go ahead and describe. So publishing and movement building. First, I'll say something about the project. It's a nonprofit. Uh, it's committed to be a pure nonprofit, so no revenue streams. It will never sell any of the information or hide it behind a paywall. It'll never sell anybody's data for marketing purposes. It'll never put an ad on the site because all of those um, would corrupt the information ecology in some ways. And we're trying to help the information ecology and the epistemic commons actually like stewarding those needs to have no dual masters issues, no other thing we're optimizing for. So we're also not measuring our success in terms of number of clicks or number of shares or anything like that. Because basically any of those metric sets you would optimize for become paperclip maximizers in some way. Um, so, uh, and then the project ends in five years. Uh, so five years from a week ago, and uh, we intentionally sunset it because it makes it very clear that it's not seeking a position in the long-term power landscape. It doesn't wanna be a major media player or directing government or anything like that. So it's not an interesting place to come for power seeking ladder climbers. Uh, and anyone who wants to do good work in any adjacent space knows we aren't a competitor because we don't achieve any of our long-term goals if we don't get lots of other groups to succeed. So when we do a, our public post-mortem in five years at the end of the project, where we succeeded and where we failed, a huge amount of our success will be what things we help catalyze that in, or facilitate that are continuing afterwards, including lots of other projects. That's the movement building side. Just a general principle everybody in here should think about. It's not always the right idea to sunset a project, but it's certainly a good idea to think about because um, 
a project's ongoing existence, if it's trying to solve a problem, can be a perverse incentive. And this happens all the time. And this is most of the NGO space. If I have a project emerge to solve a problem. If I really solve the problem, I go out of business. But it, let's say I'm the World Food Program or I'm some now large organization where the individuals who make the choices in the organization, because the organization doesn't make choices, people do. The people have a lot of fucking power being at the top of it. They're incentivized to manage the problem forever, not to really solve it and obsolete themselves. So the pathological orientation of a system to keep being itself, if it emerged to solve a problem, is something you have to factor into the design up front. Uh, and so does it end at a certain amount of time? Is there some path to the convergence towards a solution and then it ends or transitions? Is there some governance process to uh, pay attention to that? Okay, so I'll say briefly what the publishing arm is seeking to do with the movement building arm and then we'll um, see thoughts and questions. Publishing arm, there are three types of basically long form articles we're writing right now. And then those long form articles will be translated into being discussed on podcasts and we're working on making animation versions so high school students can access them because the because the articles are kind of long and kind of in depth. So they're not something that we think everybody's going to read right now. This gets to Phoebe's question of elite versus everybody. The goal is everybody but in steps. Um, there is not one thing you can share that will appeal to the most ardent Trump supporter and the most ardent Antifa supporter at the same time very well. Um, and yet we obviously have to fix that issue if we're going to have a democracy and be able to coordinate well enough to do anything. And this, you know, we've talked about this issue before, but, you know, China has already implemented high speed trains all around the world and the US hasn't built one yet. And we're like, what the fuck? Why? Like, that's just a, one example. We could talk about it with regard to building transistors and, and lithography or supply chains or lots of things. But it's like, why can't we build a high-speed train? And, why, and it has to do with institutional decay. And specifically in a democracy, uh, in an autocracy, as we can see in China, you can get rid of the problem of internal infighting and just have everybody kind of do the same thing, or you can get rid of a lot of it through imposition of uh, top-down control. You can also do long-term planning if you have one person in rule for a very long time. And in the US, you're gonna have a situation or anywhere where you have term limits, and we know why we have term limits. Somebody will work on something for four years, the next person will come in and undo that for four years, and most of the energy is actually spent on raising money for campaigning. And so it's like, you can't do long-term planning in that situation. Um, and almost nobody invests in something that has more than a four year return horizon because it won't get them reelected. So this is a big deal to say either technologically empowered autocracy runs the 21st century and that we would argue has its own in fail cases, or we have to be able to have something like an open society coordinate better than autocracy can coordinate. This is now a design constraint of the future. How the fuck do we get an open society to coordinate better? How do we get a lot of people to not be stuck in infighting? And the way we think of this is civilizations are a way of coordinating lots of human behavior. And people who want different things and view the world in different ways, so they're predisposed to act in different ways, but that are consequential on each other. And societies fail either through excessive oppression or excessive chaos, right? The oppression chaos kind of thing. And what they're seeking is order. And the order is either imposed, in which case it moves in the direction of oppression, or if it's not imposed, usually you don't get it and you get increasing chaos. And so we can see in the US, there's almost nothing that everybody even agrees on as fact about COVID, hydroxychloroquine, viral origins, climate change, the reality of systemic racism, anything like the base understanding of fact, the base understanding of value is almost completely fractured. So inability to coordinate. So if you want to have order that is not imposed, it has to be emergent. How do you get emergent order? Now this is why we get to culture. Emergent order is, does everyone have the capacity to make sense of the world in a similar way? Do they have the capacity, training, orientation, interest to seek to understand how other people 
are making sense of the world? Do they have the ability to share what their values are, seek to understand what other people's values are and find then synthesis of what are all the values to then try to find design solutions that meet all of the values simultaneously? This, those capacities, which is collective sense-making, collective meaning-making are what allow collective choice-making in an emergent way to create order as opposed to imposition. That is fundamentally a culture process. Uh, so um, coming back, I, that was a long train from publishing. So the articles that are the basis of it are three types of articles. There's basically theoretical pieces, uh, the foundation series, we call it. There's situational assessments and there's meta news. The theory pieces are things like what we're talking about here today. What is the fundamental role of education to a civilization? What is education really supposed to do? It has to do with the intergenerational knowledge transfer and the generator function of knowledge for the autopoiesis of the civilization and et cetera. So how do we explain what the fundamental role is? How do we explain how the major step functions in education corresponding to the step functions in the techno-industrial base have, have happened in the past? How do we explain the current breakdown of it and what the future of it needs to look like? Same thing with, general informedness, fourth estate, same thing with why we can't do nuclear disarmament and why we can't stop AI arms races. What is the game theory of multipolar traps? What would it take to solve them? So the theory pieces are framing up and framing up things like, why are we sucking so much at solving climate change? Well, it's because you can't, every solution for climate change has half the world oppose it because it externalizes harm to some other thing that they care about because the pro, it's a carbon tax is the solution, but only some countries are going to ratify it. And so let's say China doesn't and the US and Europe does and it damages the GDP of the Western nations relative to the other ones when a massive geopolitical uh, grab for power is already there and that increased GDP will be invested in near term control geopolitical geopolitical military dominance. And of course, a bunch of people are gonna be like, no, fuck that. That's a bad solution. And then they'll say, I don't believe in climate change because they don't like the solution that was proposed. And then you say, okay, well, what if we could get China to ratify it? Well, then does it hurt global GDP in a way that disproportionately hurts the poorest billion? In which case they'll be opposing it because the commodity of price of food just went up or increases war because now we don't have positive sum dynamics. Or So you can't, the problem isn't climate change. The problem is the relationship between climate change, geopolitical power, markets, energy return on energy investment of the change of energy infrastructure, right? You have to think of those things together because if you try to solve one in a way that's going to externalize harm somewhere else, either you succeed and it's not even worth doing, or you don't succeed because half the world that's paying attention to that other thing resists you and all the energy is just wasted as heat um, in, in fighting. So where people think they understand the problems currently, they don't they understand a bunch of separate parts, which is why we can't succeed at anything. Those aren't the problems. The problems are how do they interconnect? What are their common generators? How do we solve that? How do we do more integrated design solution? That's what allows us to get past infighting, come up with solutions that everybody can get on board with. So the theory pieces are specking out this space. What is the current novel problem space of the world? And what do the types of solutions need to look like? What is the, the previous institutions we've had? What is the, where do those break down and what does the future of those institutions have to look like? That's what those are. And instead of doing that as a book or a few big books, it's done as a series of articles where each article is long enough, deep enough that someone can understand a principle or a topic deeply enough that they could be part of the design solution. They could be thinking about it, but they can also do it in one sitting. And then it's interconnected with the other articles. Each one will hyperlink to the ones that are connected to it. So there's this interconnected media object that someone can start with education or start with governance or start with economics or start with um, X risk or whatever, and then be able to come into the adjacent spaces. The situational assessments are where we're showing the current issues in the world that we need to understand. So describing the great uh, power games that are at play or describing why it, anything from, uh, the India-China border conflict and what it's really about and what it portends um, to the emergence of crypto and 
uh, decentralized finance and what that portends for traditional finance, all those types of situational assessments, but where the situation assessment, what we're doing that's novel compared to say foreign affairs or the diplomat or the economist is we're applying the social theory. We're looking at it in terms of multipolar traps or in terms of um, uh, coordination failures or the underlying game theory that's involved. So people are able to understand the issues in a different way that also make the theory ground itself in the current world situation. And that would give people some insight into what it would take to change that situation. Um, and then where the situation that we're addressing is fraught, meaning that there's highly polarized views on it. Then we do a meta news thing that describes the media forensics of how those views came about. So like, let's say we're talking about climate change and there's radically divergent views on how bad the problem is, if it's real, what to do about it, et cetera, the, or systemic racism. And we can see that people engage in statistical warfare where they all cherry pick their statistics to make their case well, and narrative warfare where they frame the conversation to make their case. So what we wanna do is be able to say, okay, well, what are the various narratives about this? Sometimes it's just a left and a right, but obviously sometimes the Antifa far left and the establishment left are totally different narratives um, and similarly cross space. So we identify what are the narratives that are currently trending? How do we steel man each narrative? How do we argue its case for it as best as it can? and identify then what is authentic signal or truth or real value in it, both the values and the sense making. Then is there anything that is clearly falsifiable or omitted or missing or framed? Let's identify that. Then let's be able to do that across all of the narratives and then say, what can we say synthesizing about the space as a whole and also show where the way that social media algorithms have have driven that tribalism or the way that very specific economic actors started paying for media or science of a particular type or acts of kind of framing that create propaganda narrative war. So in reading that, the one of the things that happens is people start to get the aspect of media literacy that they get a mimetic immune system. They see that the thing that's being called news and even a lot of what's being called uh, communication of science is actually narrative and info war for specific economic or political agendas. And they start to recognize the tools of that, like cherry picking of data or decontextualization of a fact, which will still make it through a fact checker or Lakoff framing the fact. All that will make it through a fact checker and you can still lie with that stuff. So they'll be able to start to recognize that and recognize that they are victims of a narrative war camp more than they are sovereign thinkers. And so the goal is that they can recognize it and have an immune system against it, a mimetic, you know, epistemic immune system, and then also develop the epistemic tools needed to actually make sense of complex topics. Uh, and the hope is once someone has done that for a few things and they realize that the camp that they're a part of does say some true things, but also they can see where the errors and omissions or actual narrative war occurred. The camp that they thought were total idiots is actually saying some true and important things. They can see that it's not good guy, bad guy. It's across the whole space. There are, there's a competition that creates distortions based on partial truths or based on partial value sets. When they can start to see that and get out of it, then we start to create a new third pole outside of the polarity of people that can operate at the level of synthesis rather than thesis, antithesis. And that becomes the strange attractor of culture. So those pieces together will all interreference each other, the meta news, the theory of the situational assessments, and collectively we call that the consilience papers. And the consilience papers kind of like, you know, what, the Federalist Papers were to the Constitution, a frame of the issues and a frame of the theory that says this is the type of governance. This is a frame for the world to be thinking about what are the types of solutions moving forward that make sense, that address the, the issues that are framed up here. To make that more accessible, each piece will go on a podcast and have many different people who are involved dialoguing about different experts and thinkers in the space will become a, a simpler article and animation. So then you get a transmedia object of all those methods of communication. All of this is, um, you know, open commons, copyright, anybody can use it, modify it, advance it. 
Uh, and the goal is not that we do all the work. The goal is we is that other people get inspired to do similar work, to disagree, to whatever. Great, disagree with one of the points. Now the conversation about these topics is becoming the center of culture. Publishing side. Movement building side is maybe there's a group that is trying to fix journalism already by addressing perverse incentives in journalism. Maybe there's a group that's trying to fix education and improve civics and education. Maybe there's a group that is working on um, supporting parenting to be doing early childhood development well, or uh, a, a group that is working on solving social media algorithm bias issues. We would say those are all actually working on this cultural enlightenment. They're working on facets. They might not be framing it that way. So we wanna be able to identify the ones that are actually well-informed, have good strategy and signal boost them, and then reframe those as parts of a shared cultural movement and be able to help more attention, capital resources flow to those projects and be able to help them be seen as, so when the movement starts to become self-aware, it is a, it's able to start creating better relationships and knowledge sharing and uh, catalysis and like that. That's roughly the, the two branches names of the project. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much for the, the great uh, explanation and all the context. It's very nice to get, you know, deeper, a, a deeper um, development on why this is important. I've read, obviously, uh, a lot on the continuous project to prepare, but uh, that there is very useful. Um, okay, so I have a lot of thoughts and questions, but I really want to hear uh, Phoebe's um, on what has been just said, and also on how, uh, as Alexandros uh, asked in the chat, uh, how moral imaginations uh, ties into uh, what has uh, just been described by Daniel. I just want to precise that um, we will be doing a specific session on moral imaginations and that uh, Phoebe also showed up in this session as like the advisor to the Consilience Project and Foresight Fellow. Um, so on, it will be actually on May 4, and we will have, uh, I mean, I'll let you explain, Phoebe, and uh, what moral imagination is and uh, what this session maybe might look like. And, uh, you know, if you want to just go for it and has, have any remarks on what uh, Daniel has just said um, about continuance project in general, uh, just, just go for it. You have the floor. Um, Thank you. Um, yeah, it's brilliant to hear you talk about the project, Daniel. I mean, we've we've talked a lot about consilience. So, um, but every time I'm, you know, it's like stimulating a lot of thinking and framing. And I, I guess for me, what it feels like the project is doing that's really important and needed is this kind of framing. Like, if we think about the need for movements in this in this next few decades, like this, the kind of scale of change that's needed to move from um, a kind of doomed society and civilization to one that has a chance of um, long term flourishing. Um, this this sort of framing. I mean, you didn't really go so much into the social theory part of the project, but this this thinking and framing and um, ability to give people an understanding of what sorts of projects are worth working on and and how to coordinate and how to make sense within a larger uh frame of what is needed it's it's kind of like a meta theory of change is kind of how i've been thinking about it. it's like offering a meta theory of change that a lot of uh more micro theory of changes can um kind of self uh evaluate and and fit around um, I also think it's, you know, I think a really key thing that you you have highlighted and talked about is this connection between sense making, meaning making, and choice making, um, and you know, ultimately this being perception, um, and and the ability to make sense of the world, the ability to to make good choices, and then um, consilience also giving, um, you know, theories and and thought out. Uh, yeah, theories and hypotheses on what sort of work is needed. Um, yeah, but I, I'd like to I'd like to hear you go more into the social theory part, but maybe we can come back to that. I guess what I am interested in is like I completely agree with with the entire thesis, but the big the big uh, task at hand is like how to how to improve 
um, sense making, how to how to you know really build the capacity of citizens in epistemic justice, in um, you know kind of reclaiming perception, um, you know perceiving complexity, being able to do that kind of complex thinking. And so this is really how it connects with the work that I have been doing and um, am passionate about, which is really this capacity building um, on the practice level. And, and it, you know, there's a big question around how do you scale that? You know, how do you get that kind of uh, work out into the world at scale? Um, and I can go into moral imaginations a, a little bit, but I'm also conscious that as Lou says, we'll have a two hour session on 4th of May where I will, um, offer one of the exercises that we've developed and prototyped with now 400 people. Um, and then we can go into it a little bit. And I would love to, you know, get your feedback if you want to come to that session and uh, dive into that work and, and talk about, um, yeah, the, the potential of it. Um, but I can just say on a kind of high level, that work for me has really been inspired by actually um, diving into the concept of moral imagination, which to me is really about uh, reigniting a movement. And I, I'm really excited about you know, this framing of movements, um, a movement of bringing kind of morals and, and virtue. I really like this phrase, civic virtue, like bringing the va like values of what is important back to the center of what we do and bringing it alive through a kind of rigor of feeling, a rigor of imagination, which is a weird thing because it, you know, it's like, how do you do that? How do you do imagination and feeling uh, rigorously, um, which I think is, is a, it's a big task. But to me, that what's interesting to me is how do we get out of just the theoretical and kind of intellectual level? Because to me, sense-making is uh, embodied and, it, and, and it's, it's, based, it's also involving feelings and emotions and perceptions and, and that uh, you know, uh, warm data of memories, identity, who we are, um, the, you know, the thing I'm grappling with there is, is how to scale that because, you know, how, how do you do that? Is it, is it kind of self-organizing like small groups of local citizens with who are trained or who have, um, yeah, sort of run sheets or instructions on how to host these processes? That, that's a whole question that we can go into. Um, but that, those are the kind of questions that I'm grappling with because I, I, yeah, I think to complement the work that that Daniel's just been talking about, which, which I feel is very much focused on the kind of understanding and framing and, and it's quite intellectual and, and feel free to push back at that, Daniel, or, or I'd love to get, get into that a little bit, but it does feel quite intellectual. And I guess one of my questions is how, how can we complement that with, uh, yeah, the shifts in perception and the sense-making that requires kind of depth of experience and shared uh, process and um, yeah, maybe even the collective doing that sense making together. You notice how with something like Girdle's incompleteness theorem, logic can notice its own upper boundaries, right? Uh, in Tarski's theorem, it's a kind of formal logical analysis of the upper bound of what formal logic can do, that a formal system can identify its own validity, but not soundness. Soundness is something outside of that system. So what is that? Um, the idea that uh, intellectual capacities and the values are separable is like, it's not a real thing. And I think you know that. Um, to even invest in intellectual capacity shows a value. There's something that one values that creates that investment, right? They might value truth or value um, uh, they might value knowledge or any kind of thing, but at the basis of it, there's some value of truth that has to do with some respect for reality. That is the thing you actually want to kind of deepen the awareness and emphasis of, but why we say consilience, right? The, that, that word means being able to take many different perspectives and different epistemic and values perspectives on the same topic 
and get different insights about that topic. So you actually get a richer, more multidimensional understanding through taking many perspectives. So rather than the idea that the perspectives are here to debate or fight with each other and one is gonna win, it's no, we actually want to take all of them that we can. This is the, uh, this is diversity and then synthesis, right? Um, and so if I really value good sense-making, I have to value understanding other people understanding their views, right? Which is why this steel manning is fundamentally an empathy exercise. If I'm going to steel man another view, I'm gonna say, I'm actually gonna transcend tribalism and in-group, out-group dynamics. And rather than say, those guys are bad because they're saying something that seems threatening or scary to me. And I, uh, I'm gonna actually seek to understand, well, why would I do that? Fuck it, and I'm just gonna to try to win whatever the culture war, the political war with them is. Well, because they don't stop existing when I win. This is, a, this is the short-sightedness of cultural arms races. If I, use, if I win a political campaign or I win a messaging campaign for the, to you know, be able to change some law or some dominant zeitgeist of a thing, the people who feel otherwise don't stop existing. And whatever new, better mimetic warfare technique tool or um, voter engagement process I came up with, they reverse engineer just like actual weapons and then utilize back. And what you get is just an exponential increase in narrative war, an exponential increase in culture war and exponential war of any type self terminates. And so the idea that you can just like, we're right and good. The other ones are wrong and stupid. We have to use the best tools to get everybody to believe in our version of climate change or vaccination or whatever the fuck the thing is that we're sure we're right and good about. Like that thing doesn't work. If anybody pays attention, you get ba battle wins and an increasing escalation of the consequentiality of the war as a whole. Um, and so when you start to get that, you're like, okay, is there a way to transcend the war? Is there in-group, out-group dynamics are old. We, we have a tribal origin, but tribal warfare multiplied by exponential tech self-terminates. So how do we get past in-group, out-group dynamics? We've unified our in-groups beyond a tribal scale by a shared enemy, but you don't get to keep doing that in a multi-catastrophe weapon world that you can't put mutually assured destruction on and survive. So we need some new method of cohesion that doesn't make any, that doesn't require enemies. As soon as people start to get that, then it's like, well, we actually have to coordinate. The Von Clausewitz said, uh, war is politics by other means, but the other side of that is politics or being able to come to coordination or agreement with each other is how you sublimate warfare, which is the, the other default that you get. So if the warfare is too costly and don't wanna do the warfare, then I can't just try to beat the other guys, right? I have to actually say, how do we come to see reality in a similar way and come up with something we can all get on the same page with? And I can't do that if I don't understand where you're coming from, if I can't inhabit the position. And if I try to do it with pure rhetoric, right? Like I'm, I'm just going to try to say the words like a, a, a GPT-3 algorithm would do it of your position. I won't be able to actually inhabit why that those values matter so much and how your position is going to change when a new thing comes about. When I really inhabit it, I start to get the generator function of where you're coming from. So I can come up with solutions that might actually work for you. And I actually care about where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. And so steel manning seems like this logical argumentation method. And what it really is, is empathy across in-group, out-group dynamics to be able to say, we actually have to understand the values that everyone is in service of and the way they under, they are seeing the world. And we have to understand it in a non-pejorative way to have a possibility of both seeing truth and coordinating well. Um, so the idea that you could do an effective intellectual thing without a deeply relational uh, and embodied and ethical thing is actually a fallacy, I would say. I'm not sure I agree because I think there are people who do who do purely intellectual things without deeply empathetic positions all the time. Um, but I, I appreciate what you're saying is Oh, it's just that they're wrong. Well, sure, but I guess the what you're trying to do is to is to shift culture and to get people in, you know, to take take up this kind of new culture of uh 
sense making with this care and virtue and i think does that make sense does that yeah, it's that it's not that you can't do an intellectual thing it's that you won't get the right answers so that even if what you're caring about is true just truth i, I don't give a shit about the other people which would be nonsensical because as soon as i realize if i even give a shit about my thing that i care about i don't want escalating arms races I get uh -huh. it. I, I get it and agree. What, what I mean is like how to shift minds and hearts to that place, to the place that we're both talking about that we need to get to, to have this sort of movement with citizens. That's, yeah. that's the bit that I think I'm interested in. Well, so for, for some people realizing that the in-group win that they really passionately care about is going to fail inexorably going to fail. If they don't get past in group out group, that is a motivator to be like, fuck, I have to understand those guys. I have yeah. to, and, and it's the beginning, right? Because right? there's a belief that the current thing will succeed. Mm -hmm. It is a part of continuing to do it. So yeah. being able to get that it'll fail and that they have to approach it that way is, is a starting point. Now, how do we actually get it to happen? So this is what we talk about movement building and if you think about and and i don't mean movement in the way we normally think of movements i mean movement building more like the the hippie movement is a good example because it had to do with environmental values and feminist values and environment and uh globalist values and free love and all kinds of things. It wasn't a specific movement. It was a zeitgeist. It was totally decentralized. Who led it? Nobody led it. John Lennon wasn't the leader. You know, it wasn't led by um, the Black Panthers or one or Greenpeace. They were all parts of it. It was a zeitgeist. The same with like modernity and the enlightenment or any of the, any kind of enlightenment like that. So what we're talking about is a, something that has to become like that. So for instance, Who's going to read 45 minute articles with big words? Not everybody, right? Like some people who are oriented to that and care. And then some of them say, okay, I have a podcast. I'd like to talk about this in a way that makes this available to a lot more people. And I know how to speak to the audience that I speak to. Or I have a TikTok channel and I read this and I'm just interested and I'm going to talk to my Gen Z audience or my hip hop audience or my uh, whatever it is, because it appeals to someone who's adjacent to knowing how to do that through art, through media, through other methods. So we had somebody contact who's working on a rap battle platform with a lot of the top rap battlers. And he's like, I, I, the reason I'm wanting to do this rap battle platform is because the rap battle is a way to take the aggressive pissed off rivalrous energy and sublimate it through art, mm -hmm. but they can be in it. And to be good at freestyle rapping, you have to develop language skills and thinking skills. So it's a way to actually create a desire to even to take their anger, to take their ego and have it develop them in some way and sublimate the violence. Mm -hmm. So he's like, well, what if we got the best rappers around and if they want to rap on police violence and uh, racial issues and whatever, and you're doing pieces on that that are more comprehensive, you will train them up on those pieces they'll come do this rap battle thing and everyone will be like, fuck, how did, how did you learn all that stuff? How do I learn all that stuff? And it starts to create an incentive within a specific channel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can start to imagine all of the different subcultural groups having different ways of being approached. I would have never thought of that. And there've been a number of other ones like that that I wouldn't think of. And that's the point, right? The point is you don't have to try to think through all of the steps in in a auto poetic system you have to say can we put something forward that some people will resonate with and then their collective intelligence gets to know how do they continue to advance that front so getting auto poetic collective intelligence can we get something where some more people are more actively engaged and now the system is smarter that thing converges to where it needs to go mm -hmm. And I think a key part of that is also that Consilience plans to offer, you know, innovation prizes and do this kind of uh, tending and um, building of resources and capacity of these movements. Um, just to dovetail on that, and then I kind of want to hand it over to the audience, right, because there, there are questions in this Slido, but 
I, I actually, I have a scientific background. And so like, I really came from like a very analytical place and I've fully come over to the place where I really believe that sense-making and epistemic justice and becoming more fully human like rests on on the the shoulders of art and creativity and that's why like that's why you know I'm putting a lot of time into developing mass collective imagination practices which is totally not where I ever saw myself going but um I don't think we can do this kind of sense making without engaging um engaging people on a level that is like past rational like not just the rational it's also just like the that space, that space of kind of, as I said, memory, identity, love, you know, it's that gray matter goo place, which actually the right wing weaponizes really, really well. And the left wing really does not know at all how to work with that at that level. Um, anyway, that would be a whole discussion in itself, which I'd love to have another time, but. Wait, um, so the fact that you say I'm a scientist and I moved into this place was because of identifying started with the scientists because of identifying the criticality and utility of science. And then you also understood that its upper boundary is smaller than the problem space. And yeah. so it's necessary. It's not we're going pre-science, right? It's necessary, but not sufficient. And so you're saying what additional human capacities in addition to the philosophy of science are also needed for uh, full humans, full relationships and a vital civilization. And this is critical when we get into sense making and is it an intellectual topic and specifically problem definitions and problem solving. One way of looking at what the generator function of the issues is of existential risk, uh, catastrophic risk, is that the way we solve problems almost exclusively causes additional problems, usually worse ones. And it's because we define the problem in a narrow way. The problem is getting SAT scores up. The problem is getting voter turnout. The problem is getting CO2 down, The pro whatever it is, right? Well, can I do that and succeed while harming something else that I was outside of what I'm measuring and paying attention to? Yeah, all, all the time, right? The, the problem is getting GDP up because that's going to equal increased quality of life in GDP per capita or whatever. Well, can I ruin the environment in the process? Can I use nitrogen fertilizers to plant uh, CO2 sequestering plants to take CO2 down in a way that drives dead zones in the ocean faster. Can I like, so, so the question is, what is the real problem? It's actually beyond any scientific model I can ever give because I can never say what is in the unknown unknown space of things that are connected that I haven't paid attention to yet. But if my vow is to anything smaller than that, I will become a paperclip maximizer under good intention. Right. Ultimately, I've got to say, okay, well, I'm my best understanding is these are the way these things are connected. So we work on it, but then we find that we're externalizing harm to some other critical part. We have to change it. What is it that recognizes? It's not the model of these 12 metrics matter, these 17 goals. There's something that can recognize what else is meaningful that is connected. It has to be able to keep changing the thing, right? Upgrading it. And fundamentally, we have to operate from there and so with that so we can continue to scientifically make better models but the model is never actually reality and that's kind of the key insight and there's a place to be able to have a connection to and a devotion to reality and that says the model is useful but it's not real it's not it's not the reality it's just useful and it'll also be problematic and we'll have to change it and taking the model as if it is more than that is kind of false idol worship which ends up being the, you know, uh, path to the dark side through good intention. Thanks. Um, I'm just looking at the questions on Slido. There's a lot of them that are anonymous, but uh, there's an uploaded one. Luke, am I, should I? Yeah, I, really, I mean, I think, I think we should go uh, for the first one, which is, I mean, we've, we've brushed on it uh, through so many angles, but perhaps yeah. um, asking indirectly is still very interesting, which is the question of governance and how, how we can get uh, both effective and legitimate governance uh, in this world where um, the, of which the mental complexity is, uh, as said in the question, uh, far beyond the mental complexity of the average citizen. 
Um, yeah, and perhaps, um, I mean, I guess all these questions, we could spend a really long time on it, but um, your shortest answer possible um, so that we can take as many of the, the questions of people who are here in. How do we do governance in a situation where the info complexity is beyond what can be synthesized in a single person? Is that the question? Yeah, I think, I think that's the question, yeah. So obviously the question is where does the information complexity get synthesized? What is, if not a person, what is a capacity? And this is why a lot of people turn to AI, the other answer is, collect, is CI, collective intelligence. So what is a capacity that can process the actual complexity of it adequately to come up with appropriate choices? Few things I would say here. One is even though information or just total data grows on an exponential curve, what is really uh, necessary for us to contemplate in choice making that has to do with starting to make sense of that data and get meaning out of it, the kind of real situational intelligence to inform meaning is a second or third derivative of that. And you can involve machine learning to help process, pre-process chunks of that without needing it to be true AGI that creates an interface layer between humans being able to get stuff that is partially pre-processed, but that then needs general intelligence. Then the question is, what are the collective intelligence processes? between people. And I and it this would take a whole session to even start to unpack, but I'll say a couple parts. The uh, quote by Charles Kettering that a problem fully understood is half solved. And the corollary being that a problem not understood is actually unsolvable because you don't even know what you're trying to solve properly. There's a process of getting design constraints that needs to be factored into any problem solving process where you have to say, do we understand the etiology of the problem and the problem embedding landscape, meaning not just this problem, those sets of metrics, but the other things it's connected to well enough that our solution is addressing what caused the problem, addressing the intrinsics of the problem and not externalizing harm to adjacent things. And so, and you've got to separate, there is a kind of first, second person part of that and a third person part, which is what are the things we value that we care about that can't be measured? And then, and maybe we can measure things that correlate, but it's ultimately a value. And then what is the third person sense making about what is actually happening and the forecasting of what would the effect of a particular action be? And so there's different epistemologies that you apply to kind of third person sense making, to forecasting, and to second person values generation. And so we have to take the partial sense making that lots of people have and lots of groups have and be able to vet it, to verify, fault, you know, falsify, verify, and then synthesize it. And then we have to also do values generation that way. Okay, so you're mainly focused on the environment. You're mainly focused on the economy. You're mainly focused on national security. Why does that thing matter? Okay, now let's separate your desire for national security from your strategy because your strategy requires fucking the environment. Let's separate your value on the environment from your strategy because it involves fucking the economy. Let's just say we care about the environment. What are the key things that have to be paid attention to here? We care about national security. What are the key things? Maybe there's some assumptions that we can get rid of maybe the strategies jumped too quickly to a particular strategy because they weren't looking at the rest of it. But if we put all those values together and then say, is there a synergistic satisfier or a better synergistic satisfier that addresses all of those values? That's a really key part that is radically under addressed in most any kind of system of governance. And can that be decomposed so we can do it in parts, but then recompose with thought on holism? It can. Now it needs people that are oriented to and capable of doing that. Plus it also needs systems that are capable of doing that. And who's gonna build the systems? People that understand it, which is why it has to start with the people. And so this is why starting with some people, right? And a culture first is a starting point to a hopefully autopoetic process. That is not a adequate answer, but it was what seemed like something. 
<laughs> we could definitely uh, spend the session on it. Um, actually, I'm pretty excited also about the next question, and I think it might also get into uh, it more deeply. And um, I think it was asked by Eric. Eric, do you feel like uh, giving a bit more context on your question on whether the Consilience project is um, uh, modernist, postmodernist, or metamodernist project? And um, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Can people hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Great. Um, uh, this has been really interesting. Thanks. Uh, I realize that this frame, the frame of the question might not feel helpful, but, um, and you know, maybe this is, uh, just maybe it's on my mind this, this this framing because I'm we're doing a session tomorrow on sort of meta modernism so it's it, yeah it's sort of fresh on my mind uh, but I thought there were a lot of overlaps and resonances here between consilience and the meta modernist sort of political framework um, and I thought that the meta modernist framework might actually offer some some insight here but sort of side note to this which is that um, you know, it's often hard to choose which frameworks to use especially because there are so many of them to sort of be vying for um as phoebe called i think the meta theoretical framework uh status so um like it seems like there there's sort of a lot of meta theoretical frameworks and almost like an a, a sort of meta theoretical framework industrial complex we have to deal with here <laughs> you know when theorists make their livelihood off of, off of producing these sorts of things um, you know, you run into the problem maybe that, that Consilience is trying to solve, which is like, you can sunset a project, but you can't sunset a theorist. Um, and maybe we need to sunset theorists. And I say that as a theorist, you know, I don't mean that with any hostility. Um, there's just so many concepts, I guess, that, that uh, we try to relate. Anyway, so the question of modernism, postmodernism, and metamodernism. Uh, I'm wondering whether um, in a sort of reductionist sense, uh, you know, if we think of modernism as, or a modernist project as being, trying to sort of universalize a particular logic and its sort of associated force, and a postmodernist project maybe seeks, seeks a sort of foundationless exchange of forces and logic, so many different things sort of existing side by side. Um, a metamodernist project would seek to sort of reconcile diverse experiences within a unified whole. And it feels like Consilience is, is working on that. I mean, I feel like, uh, Daniel, many of the things you've been speaking about here seem to relate to that idea. Um, so I think if, you know someone like Benjamin Bratton maybe is doing more of a modernist project, trying to build sort of planetary governance and terraforming the whole planet maybe pluriversal concepts are more postmodernist, right? Trying to sort of uh, create, you know, human civilization, this sort of ecosystem with harmonious ontologies and their associated cultures living aside each other. Um, but the Consilience Project, yeah, it seems quite meta-modern, uh, particularly this effort to reconcile diverse perspectives and experiences into something coherent. So I guess the, the thought I had around sort of transmedia and, and sort of tracking down what you call the deeper generator functions beneath the world's major problems. Um, yeah, it just has, has some real resonances here with, with um, Hansi Freinach's idea of sort of transpartisanism. Uh, so this idea that one should seek to um, sort of create an interchange between all parties and truly listen to where those parties and perspectives are coming from. So rather than winning, I think, as you put it earlier, you're know, trying to actually re resolve tensions. And I think this relates maybe to some of the democratic questions that are in some of the other uh, questions, you know, someone like John Dewey would say that, you know, democratic culture isn't just about voting. In fact, that's the bare minimum. What you really need is like a, a, a public that's invited to participate in democracy. And then that brings them into a culture of, of sort of de democratic um, participation and education and discussion and so forth. Um, so I guess, I guess one of the things that metamodernism seems to be doing that I haven't found in the Consilience Project um, is this question of like the individual and addressing the way that like the individual, I think if we were to think about democracy in a sort of complex way, it's not just about individuals making choices. It's about groups of individuals sort of finding their collective interests and then voicing those through democratic institutions. And, uh, the meta modernist project tries to sort of look at, um, this, I have like this idea of trans individualism. So like not just thinking about the individual or the collective, but kind of like the shuttle between the individual and the collective. And so I guess the question I'm trying to ask really here is whether metamodernism might help you to think about sort of group participation in democracy and whether whether the, the sort of basic unit that you're trying to address, your historical agent or whatever, is the group rather than the individual. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, good, good increase. So the metamodern movement and thinking um, and the integral movement and thinking are obviously both uh, relevant connected a uh, number of the people who are in the kind of core team of consilience have been contributors to metamodernism 
um, friends with Hanzi and you know that kind of work um, and in Rome there. Uh, I, I would say that they definitely have some shared ideas and adjacencies. And one way of thinking about it is the thing that Integral sometimes calls tier two in a very simple way, a relevant thing of talking about is operating intentionally at the level of synthesis, kind of in a simple Hegelian dialectical sense is have we understood a thesis well? Have we understood an antithesis well? Do we understand how they relate? And is there a higher order uh, perspective that doesn't put them as dichotomous, but holds them as being part of a kind of a higher order understanding? So individualism and collectivism need to live in a synthesis. And so we can see failure modes of societies in either direction. Advantage the individual in a way that leads to tragedy of the commons type collective issues and in and chaos issues or advantage the uh, commons and collective in ways that lead to too much imposition and lack of freedom, et cetera, on the individual. And we can see so many propositions for new social models that fail on either of those sides. So instead, we want to say, what is the relationship between the individual and collective bidirectionally? How do collectives condition and support individuals, how are collectives created by the emergent behavior of lots of individuals, and how do we get a virtuous cycle between those? And so, you know, you'll see things like, no, we don't like welfare, um, and so we don't want UBI or anything welfare-like because we want agentic individuals. Um, we don't want ones that depend on the system and create free rider issues and that kind of thing. Uh, but then, a particular model of doing that that doesn't recognize that everybody doesn't get access to the same health care and the same education or the or the same type of developmental environments. And so um, a lot of people are left in utterly fucked situations that then ends up damaging the society as a whole. Um, most of the answers fail in one of the two directions. But if you instead say, okay, well, how do we do how do we do support individuals in a way that increases their sovereignty and agency rather than increases their dependence? How do we support the kind of increasing uh, individuality and citizenry capacity of people so that you have collectives or, yeah, we'll say collectives that are conditioning healthier and more autonomous and free thinking individuals who are also oriented to contribute back to a better collective and you get a virtuous cycle of both upregulating. That's the kind of thing that I would say any cultural enlightenment has to get some version of that. And an Indian cultural enlightenment, a Chinese cultural enlightenment, an Islamic cultural enlightenment that would draw on some of the unique history and worldview and heritage, they, they, they would all still need to get that thing, right? They would all need to get the synthesis of rights and responsibilities, which relate to individual and collective. All of those deep kind of polarities. Um, and metamodernism is basically, I mean, one way of describing it is post postmodernism, if modernity was an answer to the question of like, we can see that modernity gave rise to modern democracies and open society, which is if the scientific method allows us to all come to the same conclusion on things, there's an inherently unifying element of it. And if that combined with a Hegelian dialectic of being able to take each other's viewpoint and then seek a synthesis, and those are both key aspects of modernity, right? Um, then we don't have to have some few people impose government on everyone because the people can come to shared sense making and have shared choice making that's effective. Because it was clear you couldn't, there are cultural antecedents to democracy. You can't do shared choice making on people that have no basis of reconciling what they value or their views of the world. And so modernity was a, a, you know, a reconciliation basis. Postmodernism identified good real critiques of uh, both epistemic failures in modernity and ethical failures in the results of it and the institutions they created. But if it stays at deconstruction, you don't yet have a new way of coordinating effectively. And if we say there is no way to come to understand truth, then all there is is power. And now we're definitely extinct because then that's actually reifying the basis of the multipolar traps in the game theory. And so we have to say, no, there is actually a basis for choice making beyond power. And it 
it is our ability to take partial epistemologies and synthesize them. And it does take good, it, it does take certain kinds of values and good faith effort to be able to do that. So I would say aligned with metamodernism in that way. And then the, where there are distinctions are healthy details, healthy details to be able to, you know, have conversations that are running different versions of it. Awesome. Um, thank you. And it's a very interesting exchange. Um, okay, the next question is uh, perhaps uh, shorter to answer. Uh, the strength of a movement depends on its alliances. Uh, I think quoting the, the um, Continuous Project website, who are your allies? Well, who are allies right now? Uh, and who they will be, obviously, we hope is um, different. Hopefully, some of the uh, people on this call and groups that they know of um, will become allies. Um, and the allies all... So, uh, actually, I want to step back. I would say that there is a implicit, unofficial official alliance with everyone that is working towards anything that would fit within the existential hope umbrella. Um, including, and even if they aren't framing it that big, if they're working towards a healthier fourth estate, healthier education, healthier governance, healthier economics, healthier social systems, there's a, there's a sense that we identify as allies with what they're trying to do and would want to support it. Um, in terms of people that we're actively collaborating with, we're actively collaborating with the Center for Humane Technology um, and uh, Tristan and that crew were actively collaborating with the, the Helena group um, who maybe this group knows less. They're kind of, they kind of founded with a idea of, the idea of liberal democracy is that any good solution should get implemented by the market or the government, but there are some good solutions that aren't being implemented. Why is that? There's some failures in government or market. They're not trying to solve the how to make markets and governments better. They're trying to be a shim of how do we get the good solutions catalyzed to a place that either government or market will take them over afterwards where some catalytic potential is needed. And so we're uh, working on a number of uh, projects with them. Uh, we have some allies that are in the intelligence space, which is important for the situational assessments and the kind of sense making, um, ergo and Bismarck and ones like that. Uh, yeah, so I could go on, but uh, more allies will be listed on the site soon. Phoebe, is there anyone who was forgotten in the allies or that you feel you want to mention? Um, I, I don't think so. I think there's, I think the, the potential and the exciting part is probably the potential allies um, and, and we haven't really gone very much into um, politics here and the kind of left and right and, and the fact that, I mean, in, in my eyes and what really originally um, drew me to the project was this idea of kind of different political persuasions and ideologies uniting behind, um, you know, epistemic justice and sense making. And I think there are a lot of really interesting organizations doing work in that space who will be excellent um, allies. Yeah, we've had the fortune of talking to uh, people in the new Biden administration and people in D.C. who've been in Congress or Senate for a long time and who, even if they have been actually the, um, the people waging partisan warfare uh, historically are more concerned about it than they have been in terms of recognizing I like it's very interesting how many people in DC I've spoke with in very senior positions who are afraid of the end or irrelevance of the US in a way that they weren't even a few years ago. And as a result are think, thinking and willing to think more deeply about, it seems like we need some approach that is different than who wins every four years or you know two or six years uh, and that they can see issues like social media has affected democracy in super fundamental ways where everybody doesn't read the same newspaper. 
And how do we possibly deal with the fact that people have personalized news feeds that optimize for bias and limbic hijack? Like, uh, and recognizing more of them that you can't do mutually assured destruction in a very multipolar catastrophic world. There's an increased awareness that the way they've been trying to do things fails and they have kids, you know, and they're, and they think about that. So even if they've been apex predator game theory orientation, they're like, fuck kids and people in wall street in a similar position. And so I've been seeing a increased interest in more fundamental and deeper answers as the, as when COVID hit in particular, COVID was the beginning of, there were prescient people talking about catastrophic risk, but it became a lived experience for everybody. And most people know that COVID was a pretty not bad catastrophic risk compared to lots of the ones that are decently probable. And we got to see how not prepared we were, even though we should have been prepared, that people as credible as Gates were talking about it forever and we weren't prepared. And how bad our, even if we weren't prepared, how bad our responsive capacity was and how many adjacent things got damaged, right? Like the amount of food supply in India that got damaged by the supply chains being shut down from the um, closures of travel. And in the Middle East and in Africa, the rise of Boko Haram in Nigeria and food insecurity for 26 million people. There are so many issues that happen because this is again, the way we define the problem is the problem. We define the problem as COVID transmission and created solutions that caused worse problems because of the complexity of a radically interconnected global supply chain that doesn't have enough stocks to be able to deal with the flows when there's interruption and um, efficiency and anti-fragility are usually inversely proportional in a system. And so a system that optimized for heavy efficiency gets a big enough blip and the fragility starts to show up. COVID then George Floyd riots and the radical partisan conflict between the Trump and establishment kind of perspectives uh, and the increased awareness of how social media has done, contributed to that has definitely made people in top positions of institutional power thinking differently than I have seen them in my life before two years ago, which is promising. Um. Yeah, super interesting. Okay, great. Um, well, I'll take one last question from the chat. I think maybe in, if we can do it in five minutes. Um, what? Um, so it's the question from Wealth. Wealth, maybe you want to just ask it directly. Sure. Thank you. Hey, Phoebe. Hey, Daniel. Uh, this was great. I'm super excited. Um, <clears throat> I think the question was something around the lines of. What was it? Right, what attractors do you see for inversing the dynamics of limit capitalism and the attention economy in particular? Um, and kind of in that direction, if we turn the kind of persuasive tech um, optimizing for attention ext extraction around, what does that look like and how, how does it not become this paperclip maximizer uh, that we don't want. Do you want to speak to that, Phoebe? I, well, could you could you repeat the question? Because I, I don't know if I fully, yeah, grasp what sure. you're saying. So right now we have kind of the attention economy as the latest kind of stage of evolution of limit capitalism, which is like optimizing for. How do we get to the bottom of the brainstem? How do we get people mm -hmm. to make choices that are less than omnipositive? Because addiction is a great business model. So mm -hmm. how do we turn that around? What attractors do you see um, that could be something like a meta-modern revival of the human potential movement in a way that doesn't suck and that isn't cringe? And that's kind of <laughs> very deeply connected with epistemic um, kind of... Mm inquiry um but then also turns into um yeah just just embodied and enacted choice making um yeah. mediated through technology mediated through technology hmm. um well i wonder if that's possible firstly through technology it might be that it's not 
it might be that that's not how humans really regain their full uh, sovereignty and ep epistemics. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the question without the by technology part is definitely is the question that I've uh, I'm I'm very curious about and I don't have an answer for, but I I sense that it's it's I mean, the question is sort of answered by this whole all of this stuff that uh, Daniel and I are um, currently in inquiry around. Um, I think it's about engaging a different part of the mind and the and the being i mean the the technology the, the approaches you're talking about sort of hijack limbic processes and and target and use your addictions and you know use algorithms to kind of exacerbate uh addiction to yeah material online um and so I guess the question is, what is the opposite of that? And, and a lot of, uh, Daniel, you, you could speak to, you know, the, the sorts of methodologies that I guess your team has been prototyping and working with uh, this kind of epistemic immunity and um, teaching people about how these algorithms do what they do, helping build an awareness, helping build an immunity. Um, yeah. Uh, it's it's almost midnight here in London, so I, I think my brain is like not not its sharpest, but that's that's a I have a lot of thoughts on that and think it could be like a full a full uh, webinar. But I yeah I'm aware of the time as well that we've got a minute to go. Uh, I would add some things to that. Do we have a hard stop at a minute? Nope. Go ahead. I mean. People can, are always welcome to drop off if they need to, um, but please, please uh, go on. So you know it's a hard question you're asking, and um, you know Tristan and I have had a couple dozen conversations on parts of that, and as much as he's in the center of it, it's he's like pulling his hair out on how hard of a question that is all the time. Uh, I'll address a few parts. So when you're talking about the limbic economy, you're talking about a, the relationship between hypernormal stimuli and supply side economics. And that if the fundamental idea that made market theory a type of collective intelligence is that demand drives supply, that people want things that will actually improve the quality of their life and uh, that they will look at the various options that are available and choose the best product or service at the best price. I'm talking old pre behavioral econ homo economicus, right? And that's true. That type of market with a symmetry of information, rational choice making and demand driving supply is a kind of decentralized bottom up collective intelligence system. Um, and then the fact that humans don't make rational choices of course starts to break it but the thing that really starts to break it is when supply becomes so much larger than demand and its coordination capacity of course there's a symmetry between supply and demand meaning within an industry the total amount of dollars flowing from demand and to supply are going to be the same but you don't have a union of all google customers that is working together to coordinate its game theoretic interests against google but you do have google coordinating to but if Google's coordinating to, with me, so it's me against the, you know, most of a trillion dollar business. And so the degree, and they're employing AI and biometrics and whatever the fuck else that is being employed. So it's a radically asymmetric situation. And then supply recognizes that it can drive demand. It can manufacture demand. And so as soon as we start getting supply side driven manufactured demand, the under fundamental theory of market starts to break down. The intelligence of it as a system starts to break down. And then the best way to drive demand is through limbic hijacks, through the most susceptible parts of people. So then every MBA learns at the very beginning, optimize lifetime value of a customer multiplied by total addressable market is the value of your business model. So how do we get everybody to want the thing and to want lots of it? And addiction is a very good way of doing that. <clears throat> um, and once I can customize my addiction drip to each person based on their interaction in a way that McDonald's couldn't quite do and the news couldn't quite do, uh, and I can engage every aspect of their 
limbic susceptibility. They're social creatures, they're lonely, they want to see other social creatures, what are the kinds of people they most want to see, who are the kinds of people that frighten them the most, let's make their newsfeed a, a good AI optimized thing based on time on site because the business model is doing uh, time on site optimization as a basis for ad revenue. So we know the ad revenue thing has to go, right? There's a few things that have to go. That business model fundamentally has to go because you can't have AI doing time on site optimization. Now, how does that go? There's bottom up ways of, of course, some people who care about that enough exiting and building a new thing and then realizing that more health and effectiveness is created there and it becomes a strange attractor. There's top down things like being able to use antitrust law and being able to use fiduciary contract law and various things like that to try to change the nature of how those platforms operate. <clears throat> Both are hard. Both should be pursued. Um, so one, a couple things I'll say about hypernormal stimuli in general and kind of supply side stuff. We are more susceptible to hypernormal stimuli when we're in a hyponormal environment to our actual evolutionary basis. This is a really key insight, which is when most people go camping with their friends, they aren't checking their cell phone when they're around the campfire talking and playing music with each other. And they usually, if they're going to a, a festival or whatever, and they're more meaningfully engaged in the type of environments that have creativity and real connection and the, the, the underlying bases of our kind of tribal evolutionary history and whatever happening, less susceptible to checking the phone, less susceptible to addiction of all kinds. So, so we focus on the hypernormal stimuli part, but we should focus on the hyponormal environment that creates maximum susceptibility to that, which is we shouldn't be living alone. And with such poor relational interconnectivity, virtual relationships do not replace real physical relationships, et cetera. So how do you, so one thing is how do we create environments that are filled with healthy stimuli, right? The right kinds of of stimuli so that there is not this gaping wound of I need a dopamine hit from fucking something that creates hypernormal stimuli maximization. Well, that looks like community building, right? Uh, physical intentional community building, also actual communities of activity and engagement and practice. And, and does community building start to actually change? We can say that the post-industrial world created so much hyponormal basis that the hypernormal stimuli grew in that environmental niche. And so we have to actually remove the environmental niche for the success of that. That's one really critical part that doesn't get enough focus. Another critical part is in the value. Can you repeat that? What's that? Uh, can you just repeat the last? Uh, about the, the the hypernormal environment not getting enough attention and how that needs to be turned around. Yeah, the if you think about it from niche theory, if you have an environmental niche that has some energy in it, it will get exploited. So if you want a certain kind of thing not to happen, you have to actually close the niche for it. Like one of the core things we have to think about is why is humans behaving sociopathically so fucking rewarding? Like, why do, why do they economically do so well? What is the niche that we've created? Because in tribes, that wasn't the case. If you lied and fucked your neighbor over in a tribe, you got kicked out of the tribe because the small scale forced transparency and you couldn't hide the accounting. So there's a place of being able to hide it, get away with it, game the incentive system of it that creates a niche for sociopathic behavior. And then you get niche creation type processes. The same is true for hypernormal stimuli. So hypernormal stimuli, people are radically sensitive to in hypernormal environments. So we actually have to remove the hypernormal environments by providing the real meaningful things that are the basis of a meaningful human life, which involve connection to nature, connection to other people and connection to right vocation and those types of things. So that's a huge aspect that doesn't get talked about enough. The next key part has to do with hormesis and ontologic design. Uh, we started writing a paper and it'll have to get a new title because I think right now it's called something like ontologic design in the Anthropocene emphasizing hormesis. Um, but the idea there is in a world where we mostly live in environments we did not evolve to be fit to. We live in built environments that are not the ones we, that we evolved for. We didn't evolve in terms of the social environment or the actual physical built environment. And then we engage in digital environments 
of the same type. So in the digital and Anthropocene age, the ontologic design is we make the environments and then the environments are in turn conditioning us because we're plastic, right? So what type of environments do we want to create that would condition the types of people? So fundamentally we get back to what is a meaningful human life? What is a meaningful civilization? How do those relate? And then what kinds of environments do we create that are having that influence? Because you can't say, well, but we don't want to condition people. You can't not condition people. So since conditioning is inexorable, you have to say, all right, well, how do we take responsibility for the fact that that's the case? And one of the key principles is in evolutionary theory is that the strength or resilience of a system is always a result of the hormetic pressures on it, right? Meaning it's, it, a muscle has to be stressed to get bigger. Any adaptive capacity is in, is in relationship to a need to be able to adapt to different kinds of stressors. And so if I live in a temperature controlled environment where I'm never exposed to hot and cold, my metabolic flexibility will actually go down because my metabolic flexibility was there to respond to extremes of, or, you know, wider ranges of temperature. If I don't ever exercise my muscles, they'll atrophy. So if I don't go to the edge of my cognitive abilities, if I don't go to the edge of my volitional capabilities, I won't grow them. And so we grow stronger in people through hormesis, but we've had a society that has optimized for comfort and for speed and for convenience, which basically conditions omni shitty people, right? Like conditions people that are maximally not resilient and then also maximally susceptible to more other hypernormal stimuli. So there's a way that every source of hypernormal stimuli is actually in a conspiracy with all the other ones. They're not actually conspiring. They just have a shared incentive landscape. Um, and they, and they have a shared niche, which is humans that are not very self-directed. <laughs> um, and so the, the Facebook thing will make the McDonald's thing more likely. And then the porn thing more likely, and then the, you know, on and on. And so we all, we all know this thing where it's like, the people that we respect the most usually had super hard lives. Usually they had some super hard experiences that forged them. And you look at Viktor Frankl, Nelson Mandela, whatever, right? You're like, fuck, they were, they were forged in something. But we also know that most of the really fucked up people had really <laughs> hard lives and they were traumatized. And you're like, okay, is there a way we can, how do we get one of those without getting the other? How do we get the benefits of the strength and resilience of people that can overcome environmental difficulties without traumatizing them and making damage to people? I would argue that every wisdom society did that through rituals through rites of passage and rituals, that a, this is not the only thing, I don't want to reduce it, but that a huge part of what the sweat lodge and what the Sundance and what the vision quest and what the ayahuasca journey and what the yoga asana was about was something that's actually difficult and uncomfortable that we do not only regularly, but together, where I get the strength of overcoming the difficulties and we get the strength of doing that together without trauma. And in the sweat lodge, the, the key is that it's not hot enough that it's really going to hurt you, but it's hot enough that you think it's going to, and you think you're going to freak the fuck out for, like, you start to freak out if you buy it, but then you're like, okay, nobody's actually going to get hurt. Nobody ever has. Let me calm my mind, and, and I'm not going to bail on all these other people. They're staying in here, right? Well, who would I be in the tribe if I bailed on everybody? And so how do I actually get some strength over the fear in my mind? And now that person is more trustworthy as a person. I remember when I first started doing sweat lodges on one of the reservations, the shaman told me when, when this guy bailed on his first uh, time in, he said, I'll never trust somebody who bails because they let everybody else stay in here. If they really thought it was dangerous, they wouldn't do that. And if they didn't really think it was dangerous, it means they have no control over themselves. And either way, I can't trust them. And you got to see the tribal intelligence that they had, right? Which is we do this thing together and then we also celebrate together. The barn raising is not only do a difficult thing together, but be involved in creation together. So if you maximize for convenience all the time, how do you have people that have patience and presence and fortitude if you maximize for ease? So you can't, but that doesn't mean we don't like that we need to ride wagons everywhere or go back to horses everywhere. Like it's nice to have hyperloops so, and, and fast computers. It means you have to ritually insert difficulty of the right type that conditions the right qualities in the people and where there is, but why would anyone fucking do that if there isn't a virtue or a value system around that that is actually at the heart of culture? 
And so the question of how do you make people that are less susceptible to hypernormal stimuli? So get rid of the hyponormal environment and condition strength and resilience in people. Those are both critical aspects in addition to how do we deal with the tech stuff. To deal with the tech stuff, of course, we have to change the business model. Of course, we have to create a fiduciary contract relationship that if they have privileged information about people, they can't use that in a game theoretic relationship against them. They have to get the principal agent thing right. There's a bunch of things we have to get there, um, which basically says if we change the incentive, how could the how could social exponential tech be good? What would a vision for it that was good? And you have to obviously have to change the incentive to do that. There's a lot more we could say, but those are a few thoughts. Well, um, fascinating thoughts. Um, thank you, well, for the question and uh, Daniel for the like detailed uh, answer. Um, I guess it's time to close this session. Thank you for the all the of you who are in latest time zones and maybe tired and maybe feel, uh, thank you Phoebe, for sticking all the way. Um, I guess I just wanted to ask uh, to close this session if you two have any call to action or maybe you know want to answer the question quickly of like what is the thing you most critically need right now and that maybe this group uh, could provide um, and uh, yeah maybe you can leave us with that. Daniel do you want to go first? Uh, so first I'll just say thank you for everybody being here for interest and I'm grateful to uh, share that I'm very much interested to hear people's uh, you know, thoughts, interests, concerns, critiques. I see that people sent private messages here and I didn't see them because I was trying to pay attention and then this thing's gonna close and I won't see them. So if you uh, feel like there is a collaboration opportunity and you wanna be engaged in some way, uh, either message me on Facebook because it means that we'll see who we know in common or, mess or uh, Daniel at civilizationresearch.org. Um, what do we need for the Consilience Project? One very obvious thing is it's a nonprofit. We're seeking funding. If you know groups that would be interested in funding, that's obviously a critical thing so we can grow a team. Uh, in addition to that, people who understand these issues, understand some of the issues well enough and could actually contribute as researchers, writers, um, or who have design skills, legal skills, um, animation skills, other things that are relevant uh, to the overall project operational skills and that are very mission aligned. Uh, obviously very interested in that. Also, if you have adjacent projects um, and there is some way there could be collaboration, though you'll, unfortunately, I'll respond to those much slower than I wish because we don't have the internal bandwidth to engage um, the collaborative opportunities as fully as we would like. So there's a step function there. Um, and of course, if you're just interested in reading the stuff and kind of being apprised, like that's great. That's, and then if, cause you are probably doing your own projects and if what we're sharing can be in some way enriching to the projects you're doing, that's already collaboration. Um, Lou, thank you for having me and Phoebe, I'm really looking forward to your moral imaginations conversation and thank you for uh, being in the dialogue with me here. Yeah, I've really, I've enjoyed it and I, I look forward to more because I feel like we've just scratched the surface of um, the kind of intellectual discussion about what, why and how and how to have most impact and kind of theory of change, which I'm very, very keen to continue. Um, and yeah, as advisor to the project, like I, I just, I encourage you to, um, yeah, get, get in touch with Daniel and yeah, if people would like, like, I'm very interested in discussing the project as well with, um, anybody who's interested in kind of unpicking, um, different parts or brainstorming about different ways that it could have impact. So very much, um, there for that as well. Um, and then, yeah, like I'm excited, we'll, we'll be hosting more events with uh, Lou as part of my Foresight Fellowship around uh, capacity building, citizen sense making and the different methodologies and approaches of doing that from the kind of rational to the more creative and um, perhaps intangible. So uh, I think it's 4th of May is, the, is when we've got um, a session. So we'd love to see 
people there. Yeah, that's it, May 4th, somebody's put in the chat. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yes, thank you, Phoebe and Daniel. I'm really, really, really grateful. This was uh, a wonderful and uh, deep conversation. Um, will I can uh, you can send me also if you want me to share anything uh, with participants. I'm really happy to relay to the group. I will also be sharing in a follow-up email um, the invite to uh, the session with Phoebe on moral imaginations. Uh, which is on May 4th, as well as uh, this weekend, we have um, Existential Hope Writing Workshop, which is uh, an opportunity to create, to co-create uh, little fictions that will uh, be pieces of uh, existential hope and like uh, positive visions of the future that, that we want to aim for. That's gonna be this Saturday. Anyway, I'll, I'll send all these things uh, in the chat because this was already a lot of information um yeah thank you everyone for joining thank you for the fantastic questions i'm uh, never disappointed by the quality of uh, the engagement in this community and it really uh, warms my heart to see like so many people really care and um and really get into it so thank you everyone infinitely <laughs>